Okay, so here's a question. If you want the lowest latency gaming system possible, what parts do you use? Is it better to go with an AMD CPU or something from Intel? How about the GPU or the memory type, DDR4 versus DDR5, for example? Believe it or not, this is something that I actually don't know the answer to because I've never tested it. You know, we've benchmarked all of this hardware before, of course, in terms of frame rate and gaming performance, but the latency aspect is what I really want to focus on today. Now, when we're talking about latency, we're essentially talking about input lag. That's simply the delay between your keyboard and mouse inputs and the output on your monitor. Think of a mouse click, for example, and the time it takes for that to register as a gunshot on your screen. So that would include the latency of your mouse, the processing latency of the PC and the game that you're playing, and then finally, the latency of your display. So for example, if you're playing a really well-optimized game like Valorant or Overwatch 2 on a really, really fast gaming system, you can have this entire pipeline done between five and 10 milliseconds, which is blazingly quick. Like at that point, your inputs feel pretty much instant and just super, super responsive. But at the slow end, you could be looking at 20, 30, maybe even 40 milliseconds, you know, for that entire end to end chain. And at that point, your inputs are just completely out of sync. So I think we'd all agree finding the hardware that leads to the most responsive inputs, that's a pretty exciting concept. And what we're focusing on today is exclusively the PC portion of that latency chain. So excluding the latency of your peripherals, which are for the most part static and focusing on the part that makes the biggest difference. Now with the new 360 Hertz PG27 AQN from ASUS with Nvidia's Reflex Analyzer, we can actually break this down into parts. So here we have the RTX 4090, 3090 and 1060 in Overwatch 2 at 1440p. Latency of the mouse to start with is a database average, but for the most part would be a pretty static value. Then we have the PC latency, which has massive, massive differences. And then at the end, we have the latency of your display, which is also mostly static, but does actually reduce the more frames that you're rendering, which does make sense. Then adding it all up, we get the end-to-end -end latency, which is essentially the total input lag that you'd be feeling from the mouse click and what you see on screen. And yeah, there are pretty big differences, even between the 3090 and the 4090. Most people would assume that a 3090 would be brutally overkill for a game like Overwatch watch, myself included, but surprisingly, we're getting a 4 millisecond faster experience with the 4090, which amounts to about a 30% reduction. And here's what that looks like when we test even more GPUs and also include the frame rate in the picture. So average and 1% FPS on the right there and latency over on the left. As frame rate goes up, input lag goes down. And PC latency, again, that's effectively the processing latency of your CPU, GPU and game combined. And I've measured that here with Nvidia's FrameView software. FrameView is a bit of a hit and miss on AMD GPUs, which is why there aren't any included here, but we will talk about those at the end for our final battle. So again, something I did not expect here was how much an RTX 4090 would actually have a performance improvement in an eSports title when looking at latency. Personally, I thought it would be almost identical here to a 4070 Ti or a 3090, but clearly there is an improvement, even if it is a small one. But what about another input lag sensitive game like Modern Warfare 2? Well, very positive scaling again, and about what you'd expect with these sort of frame rate increases. One way to think of this chart is the right side showing the smoothness of the game and the left side showing the responsiveness. So clearly there is a very strong relationship with low input lag and high frame rates. One last game here, F122, another game which is very dependent on fast, well-timed inputs and exactly the scaling that you'd expect here after seeing those two previous games. So if you're currently on a GTX 1080 Ti and you're planning to upgrade to to a 4070 Ti, you'd see roughly double the frame rate and half the input lag. And that's about the same as going from a 1060 to a 1080 Ti, slightly more than double the FPS and slightly more than half the input lag. But going from a 2080 Ti to a 4090, we still see almost half the input lag, 18.3 milliseconds to 9.5, but this time not with double the FPS. And there's a good reason why we're seeing this. The more overkill your GPU is, the less work it has to do. In other words, it's not pinned at 100%, constantly queuing up frames and causing a delay. So although a 4090 sounds like a ridiculous waste of money for an esports machine, and it mostly is, clearly that lower GPU usage is doing something. Now, the cool thing is we can actually artificially create this lower GPU usage and zero render queue state for our GPU just by clicking a couple of settings. In Nvidia's control panel, you'll find the low latency mode that I'd recommend setting to ultra. And if your game supports it, enabling the option for reflex. So remember that total setup latency chart that I showed you earlier from Overwatch, 
Here's what that looks like when enabling NVIDIA's reflex. The more bottlenecked you are by your GPU, the bigger an impact this setting will have. Our GTX 1060, for example, sees a 25 millisecond reduction in total latency. And so with the PC latency now at just 15 milliseconds, that's roughly the level of a 2080 Ti with reflex off. 3090 still sees a bit of a reduction, three milliseconds saved there. But since the 4090 is already getting the benefits of lower GPU usage and no render queue simply by being pure overkill, we don't see much of a reduction there at all. Now, the reason that I didn't enable these settings to begin with is because most people still aren't using them. I don't know if people are just kind of like have this phobia of enabling settings and thinking that it's going to add some sort of processing delay or something like that. It's definitely not that. These are very helpful settings when it comes to input lag. And of course, if you're on an AMD GPU, they have their anti-lag, which works in a very similar way. And you'll find that within their driver menu. In the end though, the more powerful GPU that you can get your hands on, the better. Even if it feels like you have enough frame rate, input lag will continue to scale down. But how do things look on the CPU side of things? What does the difference look like there? Well, to be honest, CPUs are in a really good spot to the point where something mid-range like a 5800X3D or 13600K is not far off at all from something that sits technically at the top of the charts like a 7950X3D. In Overwatch 2, for example, all CPUs paired here with the RTX 4090 with reflex enabled, there's about a one millisecond difference between the 5800X3D and the new 7950X3D. Also note here that I've used slightly faster memory as well for that new Ryzen 9 chip, DDR5 6000 CL36 there, and DDR4 3600 CL16 for the older Ryzen 7. There's even less of a difference when looking at F122, both in terms of frame rate, 1% lows, and input lag. 5800X3D versus 7950X3D, basically no difference at all. And that also goes for the AMD 7700, the Intel 13 900K and probably the 13600K as well. In Valorant, again, most CPUs are pretty well in line with each other. 7950 here was half a millisecond faster than the 5800. And it's also worth pointing out that, yeah, if you're on an older CPU like the ever popular Ryzen 2600 or 3600, there are some big frame rate improvements and reasonable input lag improvements to be had by swapping to something a bit newer. So if we are looking for the fastest CPU, that is technically the 7950X3D. In Cyberpunk here, we're seeing over a 40% improvement in the lowest 1% of frame rate. But as we've seen at this point, the input lag savings over the 5800X3D are pretty slim, about two milliseconds all up. The 7950X3D though, in its current state is a bit weird. Some games like Cyberpunk show the performance that we'd expect from a 3D vCache processor. And in other games like Modern Warfare 2, there's no benefit of that extra L3 cache at all. So at this point, I wanted to see if I could try and fix the 7950X3D and try and squeeze a bit more performance out of it. I tried disabling the first CCD. I tried disabling the second one. I also tried AMD's Curve Optimizer, which is essentially a 200 megahertz overclock at the same voltages. And I also tried faster DDR5 memory with tuned sub timings. And the results are pretty interesting. So Doom Eternal, for example, one of those games which I tested, which just doesn't show any scaling at all over the standard 7950X. And this is basically down to Windows and the chipset driver not taking advantage of the upgrades that the new CPU has. In fact, here, the 3D chip is a little bit slower than the standard 7950X. And even by disabling the eight core CCD that has the extra L3 cache, we get the same result. But by disabling the other eight cores manually, we do improve things. And we can even squeeze out a few more FPS with some faster memory. In Overwatch 2, on the other hand, Windows is utilizing the extra V cache properly by automatically disabling the second CCD. And so manually doing it ourselves basically gives us the same result. This is where Curve Optimize is the way to go because at the moment there doesn't seem to be a way to enable both curve optimizer and disabling the second CCD at the same time. Then in Modern Warfare 2, switching either of the CCDs off is just a waste of time. And surprisingly here, even with faster timings on our DDR5 and curve optimizer enabled, we're not able to beat the average FPS of the 5800X3D or really improve things much at all. Although technically PC latency was a tiny bit faster, it is a seriously mixed bag of results when tuning and and fiddling with the 7950X3D. But how do things look on the Intel kind of tuning side of things? Well, disabling the E-cores for the most part seemed to make things slightly worse, with disabling hyper-threading also a bit of a waste of time on this game in particular. Running the same tuned 
the DDR5 timings as what we did with the 7950X3D. Performance pretty much lines up, but the Ryzen chip here is technically a tiny bit faster. We see basically the same thing in Modern Warfare 2. Disabling the E-Cores just resulted in worse performance. Disabling hyperthreading gives us a small bump this time around, and the Tune DDR5 improves things a little bit more versus the 6000 CL36 with default timings that we used at stock. Okay, so Ryzen 7950X3D, Curve Optimizer enabled, tuned DDR5 locked in. The final battle that I wanted to lay out here was the RTX 4090 versus AMD's 7900XTX. For this, I turned to the reflex analyzer on the PG27AQN and manually logged 100 samples on either setup. Basically, the same thing in Overwatch 2, not really much between them. 4090 was a half millisecond faster there, and then roughly one millisecond faster in Valorant. To be honest, that's about the difference that I'd expect. I mean, the 4090 is a more powerful GPU, but it's a nice sanity check nonetheless to ensure that one isn't wildly slower or faster than the other, both GPU makers have their pipelines pretty dialed in. I would still lean towards the Nvidia side of things for this generation though, especially if you're playing esports titles. Power consumption is a lot better than AMD at the moment, and their reflex implementation can be superior to AMD's anti-lag. Okay, so that was a lot of testing, but let's wrap things up. The most impactful portion of PC latency is your GPU. Then second to that is your CPU then memory, and then you can probably extract a percent or two when it comes to tweaking the CPU settings or memory timings and stuff like that. So simply prioritize things in that order. As for the fastest, lowest latency combination of hardware at the moment, that would be the AMD Ryzen 7950X 3D with Curve Optimizer enabled or CCD2 disabled depending on the game, the RTX 4090 with low latency mode or reflex, and a high speed dual rank DDR5 kit with tuned sub timings. However, as we saw, swapping that 7950X 3D with a 5800X 3D or a 13600K, that'll get you within a millisecond or two most of the time, and you will be saving a bunch of cash as well. So yeah, I can't exactly sit here with a straight face and recommend the 7950X 3D when those two options cost less than half, but are within a few percent. Especially if you're interested in reducing input lag, that few hundred dollars saved can buy you a faster GPU, which as we saw, will have a much greater impact. But yeah, that is pretty much it. Hopefully you all enjoyed this one or found it interesting. I'll keep some links down below in the description if you are looking for a bit of an upgrade. Otherwise, huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.